Hello and welcome to Hightailing Through History, a history podcast where two sisters get high and surprise each other with a story from history's vault of the weird and the wonderful. I am Laurel the Firstborn. The elder. <laughs> the elder. The original copy and paste there of the... I Ouch. No, I don't know. <laughs> I'd like to think I'm a bit one. of an original myself. <laughs> There's no one like me. So says the scorpions. <laughs> I'm Katie, right, the younger you. sister. <laughs> Did that take you a while to catch that? Come on now. There's no one like you. <laughs> All right, that's yeah. it. I can't sing anymore because we'll be sued. So yeah. <laughs> you got five seconds or less, I think. Anyway. Is that what hey, it is? I think okay. something like that. <laughs> hey, welcome. It's episode 66. We're so glad you're here with us in the smoke circle. We have got some history for you and some hijinks and shenanigans, apparently, <laughs> but... Uh, we're all here for it together. And fantastic beverages to boot. Hey, speaking of fantastic beverages. I made the most bomb ass hot chocolate and mixed maple syrup with, I'll t even tell you the brand, Buffalo Trace Whiskey in the most perfect quantities known to mankind. Uh, it's amazing. So for all of those of you wondering, eight ounces of chosen substitute or milk, because I used full ass Amish milk. There's a full ass on it. <laughs> so uh, we use, I think it's whole milk. I don't know. It's Amish. It's delicious. That's what we buy. And eight ounces, three, well, it depends on how you make your hot chocolate. I use three tablespoons of hot chocolate mix because girlfriend is on a schedule and doesn't have time to be making that Hershey's cocoa. And then I use two tablespoons of the maple and I believe it was two. What's the little side of the whiskey measure call it's the jigger right yeah a one ounce pour okay so i use two so i use two ounces okay. of buffalo trace whiskey with two tablespoons of warner's i don't know it's the dark maple syrup like this stuff looks like molasses it's perfect in every way it's amazing well that so. sounds fantastic <laughs> i am gonna make it Absolutely for you fantastic. next time i'm over <laughs> okay thank you because Sounds it's fantastic. So uh, what are you partaking of this evening? Uh, I have half an edible, actually slightly over half going mm. on, which uh, that's the fun thing about edibles is you take them and I wasn't sure. Well, I knew it wasn't going to kick in by the time we started, mm -hmm. but we've been on the phone for a while now and uh, it's kicked in fully just as I was pressing record. So, <laughs> so there we are. Um so half an edible, slightly over, and then I had a couple little puffs of some uh, gelato that I had left. Nope. Scratch that. Um, oh. Miracle alien cookies that I had. So. <laughs> the miracle alien cookies. Yes. yes. I believe that's a favorite of yours. I think we've all heard it before. I do Yeah, I do like that. I do. Good stuff. Fantastic. <laughs> so you're going to have a good time tonight. I'm going to yeah. finally have a good time today. Good. And uh, yeah, shall we uh, kick this thing off? Let me let me set Let's, my. Let's uh, kick it in the the uh, immortal words of da, Beastie Boys. Da, da, da. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my God! You and I would murder at charades, charades, <laughs> darling. Nay, you and I have murdered at charades, yeah. uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But no one knows the secret, man. Like you hear the song in my heart and sing it back to me, dude. It's like the highest praise I can give someone. I'm very touched by that. Oh, dude. <laughs> yeah, I am. And I know I'm kind of laughing a little bit and it doesn't seem like I'm being very sincere about what I just said, but I, I, yeah, that is incredibly sweet. Thank you so much. Anytime, man. The truth Thank has you. to be spoken. Listen, yeah. for all those of you here also listening, uh, dude, never be afraid to tell your loved ones how you feel. You got to say it now, dude. Maybe leave out the dude, but my family knows that's how it's going to come to them for me. Yeah. If actually, if the dude isn't included, I don't think that you mean it. And uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> probably like, who are you? Who are you wearing my sister's skin? Who are you? <clears throat> like Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Buffalo Bill. Oh, all right. Buffalo and we're Bill. back. All right. All right. <laughs> I'm a leaf grinder. Here oh, we it's going to happen. Bottle, leaf, grinder. Shoot. 
Oh, you crushed my grinder. Or no, I I, leaf. I grinded your leaf. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. Grounded, grinded. All right, we're going to start the story with some trivia. I actually probably think I've said this to you before, but we're going to see how well you remember it. Okay, I'm going to wait. Which big cat has the strongest bite force in the entire animal kingdom? Do you actually know I this? I know it. I know it. I know oh. it. It's a, it's a jaguar. Shit, I expected you to struggle with that one. Yeah, it is. <laughs> a jaguar, yes. We talked about it because you were talking about the Amazon rainforest. I, think. I do that. I do that from time to time. I tangent off. I like to call them side quests. <laughs> Recently, okay, so I was buying airfare. Hi, don't do it, people. Do not do it. Uh, I side quested us to San Francisco when we were supposed to go to Hawaii. No. When we were supposed to go to San Diego, I side quested us to San Francisco and I looked at Blake. I was like, it's fine. It's not that far of a drive ride. He goes, it's 12 hours. I was like, oh, shit. Oh, no. So do We you canceled have... it. It's fine. It's all okay. fine. But I side quested us hard. And I looked at him. I was like, so this is like not the time for a side quest adventure. He goes, not a 12 hour one. I was like, oh, I will say, though, if you do that, I've done that trip before. Hmm. Flown into San Francisco and then take the Pacific Coast Highway down to San yeah. Diego. That's fun. I'm sure, but not on an itinerary schedule <laughs> uh, made what by <laughs> Gandalf Blake. Uh, <laughs> was like, no. I was like, okay, well. Yeah. That to be said. I side quest all the time is basically what I'm trying to tell you. Do you what achieve about jaguars? More? Oh, yes. Yeah, so jaguars. I'm so glad you asked. So that brings me to the topic of this evening. <laughs> the jaguar. Okay, so for all those of you who maybe didn't get the trivia, jaguars have the strongest bite force in of big cats in the animal kingdom. Not lion, not tiger. Bears aren't a big cat, so we're not going there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's the jaguar. They can take turtles. They can crush them. They can drag horses something crazy like 10 miles after, like, drag their prey 10 miles the size of a horse uh jaguars are in south america are one of the fiercest predators around so the jaguar is one of the most feared predators in the jungle meaning that any warrior who could embody this fearsome creature would be among the most elite of their time which brings me to our topic of today we are of course talking about the jaguar warriors of the aztec empire or otherwise known by their name as the Mexica. So it's spelled like Mexica, but the Aztecs are the Mexica people. So I will bounce back and forth between those terms tonight. Are you excited? You have a really excited face I'm on. I'm so excited. Oh, good. My cheeks hurt. I'm so excited. I see that. Yeah. So I will be bouncing back and forth between Aztec and Mexica. Aztec is the term a German explorer uh, gave them because they came from the land uh, it means, like, white land, which I think had to do with how, like, plentiful and good the land was that they had. Uh, it's where they built up a lot of those cities and stuff that you see with the pyramids and those, like, stacked-looking mm -hmm. housing. Um, and it translated to the white land. Uh, and it was the as as typical. So here's the problem. A lot of these terms, as hard as I looked, I could not find a pronunciation that wasn't clearly wrong <laughs> oh, okay. so some of them i have to do the best i can um the most helpful comment i saw on one of my videos that i used for uh reference was someone had commented on a pronunciation of their capital city and said if you're gonna make if you're gonna make a um pronunciation video at least get it right and it said the L is silent. So I'm going to do my best to use that as a guiding term. <laughs> okay. So Fair the enough. Mexica people are how the Aztecs referred to themselves. So I will be balancing back and forth. But they are the Mexica. So they were actually more than one kind of uh, elite warrior among the Mexica. Uh, it would be the Jaguar warrior. One that we all know. If any of us have seen the road to El Dorado. I believe there's a jaguar warrior in there. Have you seen it? I know of it. I'm sure I probably did oh, see okay. it. At First some of point, all, it's but... fucking hilarious. <laughs> you need to watch it. I think that's more based on the Mayan culture, 
but they do i think it pulled from a couple of different of the mesoamerican cultures inca mayan mexica okay. or aztec probably not historically super accurate but it's still cool and no. the two lead guys steal cortez's horse so <laughs> if i remember correctly. yeah fuck that guy <laughs> yeah seriously <laughs> steal his horse. we'll be talking about him tonight so. <laughs> his horse didn't want to be with him anyway he probably wasn't nice to the horse either so the word used to describe these elite warriors of the Mexica culture was unfindable for pronunciation. Uh, uh C-U-A with the line, U-H-O-C-E with the line across, L-O with the line across, T-L. Good luck. So I searched so hard for it. And everything I found just wasn't correct. Or if I did find it, it sounded, I hate to say it like this, it sounded like a white person was saying it. And I was like, it just doesn't sound. Oh, yeah. It saying. sounded American. Maybe that's a better word. Mm -hmm. It sounded like an American was pronouncing it. I'm like, that's not right. I know it's not right. Mm -hmm. So it was a great struggle, uh, which sucks because it's actually a really pretty language and I hate to butcher it. So I'm doing the best that I can. So the... The big long word is a combination of two words, uh, kuhutli, meaning eagle warrior, and ocelotl, ocelotl, ocelot, right? Ocelotl, mm -hmm. meaning jaguar warrior. Right? You can pull some. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of words we use today, but we're going to get to that. Hang in there. So according to the Aztec beliefs of the Mexica people, uh, the jaguar warriors represented the jaguar god tezcutipoca tezcutipoca who is the god of the night sky jaguar warrior hot so they had two elite warriors as i mentioned earlier they had eagle and they had jaguar the big difference is which god did you worship so did you want to be a jaguar warrior did you want to be an eagle warrior both uh modeled after their animal counterparts that's where they drew their inspiration they're both both of these creatures are fierce on the battlefield right so on the battlefield in your jaguar garb we shall say a lot of the sources i use called it a costume it's not a fucking costume i'm gonna yeah. fucking call you out right now that so like does a knight wear a costume like on the battlefield riding horse in his armor no it's the same thing mm-hmm it's his it is his armor so garb i'm gonna call it jaguar garb it was also thought to give you the powers of the animal right the strength the ferocity the agility <laughs> nice since they were considered the bravest of warriors they were deployed at the battlefield during military campaigns duh so unlike what most people would assume and myself included the main goal of these elite warriors was not a body count as in fatality it was <laughs> how many you can capture and bring oh. back to use as human sacrifices for later. <laughs> Much da -da 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 -da. like the Dahomey Warriors yeah. last episode, <laughs> it is mainly centered on uh, conquest, this uh, <laughs> culture. But there's a lot more to it. So right. hang in there with me. We got some fun stuff. So the foremost importance uh, was military conquest with the Mexica Empire. The elite warriors were in the, among the most respected in society, which is interesting. Uh, they were granted lands by the emperor. Think like, oh, it kind of reminded me a little bit of like the medieval Anglo-Saxon English feudal system. Kind okay. of a similar setup. Uh, so the land, the emperor would award you the lands um, and their status. You, you, you're like nobility, like a duke or something like that, right? It's a big deal. Becoming oh, yeah. a warrior of distinction is also one of the surest ways of the upward social mobility for common people. So this is what's so interesting mm -hmm. is this was a way for them to move up in society. If you can cut it as this elite warrior, you might not, you could have been the son of a farmer, but you could become one of the greatest warriors in the Mexica empire. Uh, Very interesting, right? Like it. Ja I know. Jaguar warriors were the order of, elite warriors obviously with rigorous training uh and it was required for any male of the mexica society so basic military training is of course a part of the education children of the commoners were educated in schools called the topocali 
Telpokali. While the children of nobility were educated at a separate school for the noble children, the Kalmakak, Kalmakak, uh, they were exclusive. Ooh. Right? Mm -hmm, indeed. They're, I like to call those boarding schools. <laughs> <laughs> so the main emphasis of the education, especially for the commoners, was military training, because that's where they pulled most of their ranks of warriors from. Okay. Uh, the children of nobility received education in a variety of disciplines, such as government affairs, religion, and history. They were also trained to become military leaders and elite uh, orders like the Jaguar Warriors, Eagle Warriors. Uh, the So any commoner who displayed particular, I don't know, pizzazz, <laughs> they would be absorbed into the ranks of the elite warriors, i.e. <sighs> Eagle Jaguar. Okay. Right? And if you didn't cut it in school, they straight up came up to you and you was like, you suck. You're going to be a farmer. And you're like, shit. Okay. Well, that's that then. Pack your bags and get off to the fields. Well, and that was it. Like you were done in that moment. Go home. Yeah. If you didn't cut it. Yeah. Wow. I want to be the very best. No one ever You went was. Pokemon. I was about to go Mulan. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Let's do Mulan. Yeah. All so of the back up, go home, you threw, you threw that one. There you yeah. go. Mm -hmm. So, like, mine was the moment where you were, like, accepted as a Jaguar warrior. Yours was the, like, rejection. Yeah. So, there you go. You sing the song in my heart. Or whatever it was. I said, my you soul? hear the song in my heart and you sing it back to me. That's that was fucking poetic as shit, dude. Poetic as I'm so fucking amazing. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> I messed it up, but that was really poetic and beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, so, man. I'm amazing. I'm going to need some whiskey. Hang in there with me. So after their early years of education, young men went through more rigorous training to become Jaguar warriors. The training included tasks such as cleaning areas, building walls, and digging canals. I know. Get to hard Get work. Get in there. This gave them the required physical strength and agility needed on the battleground. Like that, all around. Serving your community, also preparing to kick ass. And kidnap people, but that's besides the point. So, <laughs> trainees even followed their more experienced counterparts into battle and were responsible for transporting supplies, medical, food, whatever. Uh, sort of like a Mexica Squire is what I called it. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. I see mm -hmm. what you're saying. Who you're going to learn from. This. That's yeah. legit what I put in there. With the uh, spelled out. Because it's spelled like Mexica. M-E-X-I-C-A. Mm -hmm. That is pronounced Mexica. Mm -hmm. I heard it from a really nice, super nerdy lady who's a professor on such matters. So. <laughs> nerdy professors. <laughs> I mean, I love them. I think they're cool. And I could listen to them talk all day long. So. <laughs> Am I also a nerd? Absolutely. <laughs> so strict discipline was maintained during the training of these warriors. Anyone who breached discipline was severely punished. A customary punishment was to beat them and remove their hair, which humiliated them in front of people. So like cutting. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Uh, in more serious cases, case, excuse me, in more serious cases, such as drinking uh, alcohol, which was strictly prohibited, students could have been beaten to death. Oh, shit. Yeah, you had to earn the right to drink alcohol. Yeah. Dude, I know. Yeah, I mean, feeling a little more sober as I say. Yeah, right? You and I are like, <laughs> like oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I know. On the battleground, the Jaguar warriors were leaders of the military alongside the Eagle warriors. They led armies and formed military strategies, even off the battlefield. They were expected to be leaders and considered highly expected among society, highly respected among society, right? This earned them the right to drink Okay. when it was considered okay to do so. You couldn't just be like waltzing through town like, yeah. unless maybe you were fucking awesome. Maybe that was fine then. Uh, they could wear expensive jewelry and dine among nobility at the palace even, like around the emperor. Uh -huh. So you earn that right. Yeah. So the more... Um, people, uh, they even had different, uh, garbs and dresses. So depending upon how many you captured from the enemy, 
your rank would be displayed on you based upon how you dressed and what you wore. So you couldn't wear the color purple unless you brought back no less than four enemies. So you had to fucking rock it to get that purple. Oh, yeah. Can you describe what the clothing might have looked like? What was described in my references was uh, almost dressed like a butterfly. And then specifically to wear purple, Mm. you had to get at least that a body count like that. Mm. Yeah, I'm imagining just the most beautiful thing in my mind, but. Oh, you should see the like. The the garb of my favorite, obviously, is when they're dressed up. Can I just like can I Google search it? it? Like Heck yeah. search it? Okay. Absolutely. Just Google Jaguar Warriors. The Eagle okay. Warriors are cool too, but specifically the Jaguar Warriors are the ones I was looking at. Yeah, I think I would want to be a Jaguar Warrior if I was. I agree. They're mighty. But so are Eagles. This is gorgeous. Isn't it cool? And so fierce too. I'd be like if I had to go fight these guys, I'm like, no, I'm good. <laughs> right? I know. I'm I'm okay. <laughs> I have a feeling that that... I put uh, my weapon down. It's fine. You're good. I was going to say that probably in spot. Well, it was that or be kidnapped. So or you probably actually, would I was going to say, life. actually, I probably would want to fight because, yeah, I don't really want to be... Yeah, a human back sacrifice? Either. No. No, thanks. <laughs> so, they're not the only I'll ones pass. to do it. But, yeah. <laughs> so, their common weapons included spears. Uh... The Mashika version of a bow and arrow. It was just a little bit different. It wasn't made quite the same. Uh, It was especially designed so that the arrow could be flung with more power than an ordinary bow. Very interesting. A wooden sword. This is the one you'll most see associated with these warriors. Wooden sword studded with obsidian volcanic glass. It was one of the most prized possessions of the elite of the Mashika warriors. It is the one that you see most commonly associated with them. So if you see them brandishing, it looks like a club with stabbies on it. It's actually kind of pretty, but like in a deadly way. (laughs) Another one of their uh, famous weapon. This is another one you'll see a lot of times in pictures is a club made of hard oak with a handle made for throwing at running targets. It's kind of, it's shaped not like an axe. It is more of a club. But you'll you'll see. It's the one not studded with the obsidian volcanic okay. glass. <laughs> Listen, they were there to do a that job and they got it done, yeah. dude. <laughs> <laughs> they were. So the garb of the jaguar warriors, of the na- as the name suggests, is similar to that of a jaguar, obviously. They wore the pelt of the animal. Uh, with a helmet or a shroud that resembled the head. Mm-hmm. Uh, the it, It's a symbol of uh, religious and cultural symbolism. Again, modeled after their god, the jaguar god of mm-hmm. the night sky. Um, it was believed that wearing the skin of the animal would actually bring you the strength of. And this is not unique necessarily to them. There was also a religious reason behind capturing enemy soldiers instead of just killing them on the field of battle. Uh, It was thought that capturing the enemy soldiers and using them as human sacrifices uh, was a better way of honoring the gods than just killing them on the battlefield. Sure. Uh, Thus, a warrior who killed enemy soldiers instead of capturing them was considered lacking in skill. So not only are you trying to not get killed by somebody, you're trying to also like rope them up and take them with you. Good luck. So there's little bits of uh, Mexica culture alive today, even things that you and I would recognize. Uh, It's pretty cool, which I didn't realize that. Words that are used every day in the English language, like chile or chili, like chili pepper, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. avocado, chocolate, hot chocolate being a Mexica drink. That was not an accident. <laughs> uh, coyote. Coyote. Ocelot. Like I said, the little jungle cat, the ocelot. Even the eagle on Mexico's flag, the eagle holding the snake, mm-hmm. is inspired by the tale of how the Mexica people settled their capital city. When they saw that they were journeying, yes, journeying across uh, Mesoamerica, the Mexica saw an eagle perched on a cactus on the marshy land. Have you heard this before? 
I believe I have, yeah. Okay. Uh, near the southwest border of Lake uh, Texcoco, Tejicoco, and they took it as a sign to build their settlement here, right? The eagle sitting on the cactus, they're like, this is the sign we've been waiting for. It's been this big old lake. It's massive. So they drained the swampy land and constructed artificial islands so that they could plant their gardens and agriculture and all that and established the foundations of their capital city, Tenochtitlan, Tenochtitlan, Tenochtitlan. So the Mexica people had some of the most fearsome warriors. Yes, it was greatly centered around conquest. I think we can all agree there. However, they were also incredible architects much as the Mayans who came before them. Mm -hmm. They brought universal education to their whole empire. Everybody was educated. Except slaves. I don't think, although I don't think they had them. They, they lived to die. <laughs> On that happy note, they were fantastic artists. A lot of the carvings you'll see if you go see the, uh, a lot of the pyramids in Mexico are Mayan. There are Aztec or Mexica ruins. Um, the Mexica, the Aztec society, is closer to us than the Mayans were. They came last. So I think a little bit more is kind of left behind. So they have mm, a little bit. Like that's the yeah. language that a lot of uh, names and words and whatnot in uh, Mexico come from the Mexica mm -hmm. people. Again, Mexica, like I said, is spelled like Mexica. And -E right, sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they were fantastic artists and they had some of the best medicine of their time. I know. There's a lot going on with them. Mm -hmm. It wasn't all just war and conquest. Uh, and in fact, like those dogs, if you've ever seen Coco uh, by uh, the Disney movie. Yeah. That I can't remember what it's called, of course, but the naked the dog. Uh, a Sholo. Sholo. Um... Cholo dog. Yeah. But it's with the full name. Yeah. That's a Mexica word. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's all kinds of things. I, I love culture. those dogs. I think they're so cool. I, I love Dante. <laughs> and Dante. Yeah. He's right. Bless his heart. Yeah. His tongue out. So that is the Jaguar warriors of the Aztec of the Mexica empire. Bravo, Katie. How cool. I know. I love that. And they brought us hot chocolate. So listen, I can't be hating. <laughs> you can hear it like sloshing around in there. Oh, okay. can you? Well, that's yeah. glorious. Oh, fun fact. I don't know if I told you this, but when Cortez came to take over, remember how they left the Caribbean? If you haven't mm -hmm. listened to the history of the Caribbean, you should. Uh, it's way fucking older than I thought it was. <laughs> Yeah. I remember when I read 9000 BCE, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I should have done this in two parts. Yeah, that was a, a huge one to take, but oh, man. you did it. Good That's what she said. But <laughs> anywho, it turned out great. But as they left the Caribbean, because they realized the riches, the gold was with the Mexica, the Aztec Empire. Mm -hmm. Other tribes around them that were not a part of the empire actually joined with the Spaniards because the Aztec mm, were so right. uh, conquesty. <laughs> Maybe it's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. Um, I get what you're saying, though. They joined with them and they're like, yeah, fuck those guys. <laughs> oh, so no. that was also <laughs> part of the reason why they kind of fell as hard as they did. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It, uh, it got doggy dog out there, man. Mm hmm. Just taking a little top up toke in between the stories. I don't know about you, but I really enjoy learning about the Mexica elite warriors, the Eagle warriors, the Jaguar warriors. Which one would you have rather been, Eagle or Jaguar? In that story, there was a mispronunciation of the Mexica capital city that they established, but it was a word that I actually knew. <laughs> so to make that correction, the name of the city is Tenochtitlan. And that was the name of the capital city that was established and is now in the heart of Mexico City. We hope that you've been enjoying yourself in the smoke circle, which I always like to picture it as a cozy and sexy mid-century conversation pit. You know what I'm saying? Fireplace, pillows, weed and refreshments, and my favorite part, all of you. And if you've been enjoying the show, 
please rate, review all the things that help indie podcasts like us move up in the charts and get heard and now seen by more and more people who love history and are sexy and smart like you. I mean, I think we can always add to our sexy and smart numbers, right? Let's bring them in. Share this episode with a friend or on social media. And speaking of social media, please visit us over at Instagram at Hightailing History or at TikTok at Hightailing History Pod. Over there, we share news of the podcast, pictures from our episodes, and our history one hitters, which are 60 to 90 second videos of something cool that we learned about in history and wanted to share back with all of you. All of our social media accounts are directly linked in the show notes below. So just scroll down and you'll find us there. Up next, we go to Rome during the backdrop of World War II to learn about a mysterious disease that, despite how incredibly infectious and deadly it apparently was, it somehow saved the lives of everyone who was diagnosed with it. Are you intrigued? I know. And with that, let's puff puff pass it on to part two. All right. I would like to tell you all about an incredibly infectious and deadly disease that was affecting a number of Roman citizens in the 1940s. It would initially present itself with the usual stuff, headache, fever, vomiting, but then would rapidly attack and degenerate the nervous system until the patient's death. I know. Yeah. Eyebrows of surprise and eyes of surprise. Uh, and everyone was surprised because it was new. Doctors had never seen anything like it before, and nor would they after the 1940s. It was it was highly infectious, highly deadly, and yet it saved the lives of those who were diagnosed with it. And tonight, Smoke Circle, <laughs> I present you with Syndrome K. So tonight's history takes place at the backdrop of World War II, more specifically, though, the Holocaust. And so just to, just to give you all a heads up. I have the darn story. <laughs> Damn. So just to give you all a heads up uh, for the episode, though, we are not going to be going into the horrors of the, the Holocaust. And while I think it's certainly something to not stick our heads in the sand about, my story is going to be focused on the incredible bravery, the quick thinking, and clever ways that people stood up to Nazis, stood up to fascism, and were like, not today, Satan. Fuck you. <laughs> and so that's what I want to focus on. So my sources tonight are predominantly a documentary from 2019 titled Syndrome K, which was narrated by the late, great Ray Liotta. And in 2022, there was a book called Syndrome K, How Italy Resisted the Final Solution by author Christian Jennings. So those are my two main sources supplemented with a couple other th articles. So those are all of my show notes if you wish to take a look. Now, because history doesn't happen in a vacuum, I figured since I'm talking about what's going on with the Roman Jewry, I thought, hey, let's look at the history of the Jewish people in Italy. It is 200 BCE during the time of the Roman Republic. And that's when we're finding the first records of Jews in Italy and Rome. And from that time until 1888 CE, so like, 19th century, they were forced to live within a walled section of the city called the Jewish ghetto. There was one year when... Shit, sounds like some Egypt shit, dude. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Well, and then there's one year when um, Napoleon rolled through, and it was like one year that they didn't have to live in the walls, but then they, they went back in, and so... Well, you're just rolling through, fucking rabbits chasing after him, like... <laughs> you just know, running... Ah, right? The rabbits. Stopping after him. Mm -hmm. It's called fangs. It fears rabbits. Did you know they actually punch you? They'll box you. Rabbits, they're like, pa, 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 pa. Like a kangaroo? Kind of, yeah. That's like, they call it boxing. It's like common for uh, rabbits in captivity. Because I was watching oh. one for someone. They were like, careful, he might box you. I was like, fucking, excuse me? What? <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's exactly what I said. I said, I'll box him back. They're like, no, don't punch the rabbit. He started it. <laughs> <laughs> right they come home you guys have like little mouth guards in <laughs> like fisticuffs <laughs> wrapped up he's kicking me i'm holding him by his ears as he's like fucking thumpering me in the face <laughs> oh. oh my gosh um 
So Napoleon yeah, rolled through. Napoleon. Napoleon. Strangely and so, bringing freedom with him. For like a very short period of time and then not. So oh, okay. pretty much from 200 BC to 1888 BC. Yeah. CE then. That's how long not only have they been there, but for the most part that they've been living within this walled section of the city. Uh, after World War I, Europe was a literal and figurative mess. Um, with some countries being hit harder than others, such as Germany. In Italy, at the end of October 1922, a man named Benito Mussolini became the youngest prime minister at the age of 39. Which, yeah, is young. I didn't realize he was as young as he was. Um, or that he was even in power for as long as he is. Like 1922, I thought it was closer to the, the 30s, but 1922. And he ran on a platform of nationalism and generally blaming world war one on socialist and monarchists and so from then on italy then was ruled under a fascist government with mussolini at the helm and with the firm grip on the helm really yes. and then, similarly in 1933 a flaming dumpster fire of dog shit human being uh, rose to power as germany's he was new a chancellor. dumpster fire <laughs> His name was Adolf Hitler. So just like Mussolini, he found his way to the top by also running on a platform of nationalism and blaming World War I and Germany's post-war problems on various groups of people, with the Jews being like having the, main, the biggest amount of ire and um, hate directed towards them. But they weren't the only ones. They Nazis had a lot of people. Oh, they hated the everybody. Process. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they, they were, were so shit. They didn't discriminate. They hated super equally. Everybody was an asshole, according to them. So, you know, yeah. there's that. Equal opportunity. <laughs> so, I got, because, and because, like I said, I, I, want, I want to give some background because this stuff does not happen in a vacuum. But I was like, well, I'm curious, you know, how, what was Mussolini's anti Semitism like? You know, what were his. Mm -hmm views on all of that and i fell down a little bit of a rabbit hole which i told you about um, yeah because i got two different accounts on what mussolini's thoughts were about the jewish people and i really think it is worth mentioning so the book i read by christian jennings seems to belong to the long-held beliefs like what was typically um historically accepted mm -hmm. that mussolini largely rejected nazi ideas about race and those deemed quote unquote other and that the idea that he only started to persecute the Jewish people was to appease Hitler and to, one, try to keep Hitler from, like, steamrolling his way into Italy and surrounding areas. And two, because he wanted to align himself with another fascist government since Italy, like, find them, found themselves isolated from the rest of the European powers and Western right. powers. Yeah, so... Well, they're um, kind of down there on their own peninsula, so it's like... Yeah, and they kind of, they kind of elated themselves with some conflicts that they got into in uh, Ethiopia and in Spain. It kind of alienated mm. them from Britain and France, and it, was, it felt, <laughs> the energy of it felt a lot like, all right, fine, Britain and France, if you won't play with me on the playground, I'm going to be friends with that guy because he... <laughs> He understands me. You know? Okay. He's fascist like me and therefore, you know, that kind of thing. Mussolini also had Jews as his closest advisors in government roles. In okay, this bed. is what I heard. This was what I was told. Okay. Wink, wink. So. <laughs> I'm interested to hear. <laughs> Jesus Christ. The I'm so, the it's box. the fucking cat. Yeah. Sorry. So like, in his bed. Mm-mm-mm. -mm -mm. Because one of his mistresses, one of his mistresses. <laughs> All right. That no is, need to like a... <laughs> brag, dude. Like some of us can only afford one like Jesus. Right. So not only did he have a mistress, but he had a main mistress. And then he had like other women that he slept around with his mistress on. So, but one of, one of them, her name was Margarita Sarfati. And it, she was in a drink. Margarita. Yeah. Spelled differently, but yeah, it's pronounced okay. the same. She was his propaganda advisor, uh, a biographer, and she was also Jewish. So I went to the internet to be like, well, 
how long was Mussolini an anti-Semite? Yeah. When did everything change for him? Because, you know, th- this is it. Like, this is interesting stuff. Yeah. So I found myself, found myself in the middle of one of those history debates. Because, uh, like, I just felt like I was sitting there like, oh, oh this is bigger than me. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is a whole other thing that I found myself in. Um, so it seems like it's one of those history debates where people are of this thought where they're like, you know, Mussolini really wasn't that anti-Semitic, it, it, you know, in comparison to Hitler, I guess. I mean, I don't know what, what they're saying there necessarily. You know, that is not it wasn't very really... high praise. <laughs> You're like anti-Semitic, but like not as bad as Hitler. Oh, OK. Right? The guy who like thought it was a great idea to help murder six million of them. OK, well, at least I'm not that bad. Well, I mean, it's like, like he still, well, he still like did, he still did anti-Semitic things and, and mm-hmm. had race laws, which we're going to talk about in just a second. So it's like, well, if you weren't an anti-Semite, then you wouldn't have done those things in the first place regardless, right. you know, but so anyway, sorry, but that's that revisionist history, quote unquote, that this other group is talking about where they're like, well, yeah, he always was. It was just extra convenient for him to like really turn it on when it came to getting favor with Hitler. Yeah. So there's these, and that's why I was like, oh, this is, this is a bigger discussion. Than, than right. I. So he was always a hateful so, dude. It just served his purposes to really amp up. Yeah. So those are the, these so different he always schools sucked, of thought. Basically. But he, yeah, I was going to say, regardless of his stance on, on the Jewish people, he still sucked. So you're like, eh, it's just, he's the only one who got proper yeah. justice in my opinion, but. Because they literally just handed him to the people like, he's yours. And they were like, yes, he is. Him and that said mistress that I was talking about. Not not Margarita, but his his main side chick. His main booty call? Yeah. Question mark? I don't know. It does not pay to sleep with, uh, what do you call them? Dictators. But what I do know, and what is confirmed by history, is that Benito Mussolini announced the manifesto of the racial scientist and enacted the 1938 Italian racial laws. The manifesto stated that, quote, the civilization of Italy is of Aryan origin and that there exists an actual, like, pure Italian race, quote, whole lot of air quotes here, folks, to which Jews do not belong and henceforth are to be considered non-citizens. Yeah, exactly as your eye roll says there is that it, this is all like this quote unquote race science. You better get a whole your bunch boots of made up on because the bullshit is deep. Yeah. You're going to be trudging through. You might need waders at this point <laughs> yeah. up to the armpits, bro. If you hear something that sounded like a poop going in the toilet, <laughs> it was my turtle. It was not me. I just heard it. It went bloop. And I was like, that's the turtle, dude. That's not my. I am not pooping. <laughs> Please leave this in. <laughs> I just wanted to throw it out there. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to distract you. I know you're high as hell right now. But dude, I just, it sounded like the most like poopy ploop ever. And I was like, shit, certainly now is not the time. I'm sorry. There is not a single place in this fucking house for me to do anything without an animal in the room. I'm so sorry. I hope you hear that in the recording later. It was the loudest oh poop ploop <laughs> I've ever heard. It's because I have the light on, so now she's awake. Normally, she'd be asleep right now, but she's sitting here and just bloop. God. The funny thing is, oh my goodness, I gotta like check get this. Sorry, get this all wiped up here. Um, I'm so sorry. You, you, you think that I can actually hear more of what's going on in the background than I actually can? Well, then I just won't make comments. Well, you heard the cat, so that was as loud as the cat. That's why I was like, shit, that was not a poop. It wasn't a poop. <laughs> oh my lord! Katie's house is like wild kingdom. It she has really... like thirty thousand geckos, a giant snake, a tarantula, a cat, a giant snake. That's very a, a generous gecko, of you. And like, usually there's bearded dragons. Currently, there dragons. Are oh my gosh. Much like the Nuremberg Laws in Nazi Germany, which decreed all the many ways that Jews were non-citizens and, you know, ultimately in their eyes, mm-hmm. non-human, you know, as well, too. The Italian racial laws were very much the same 
in the sense that it was, you know, no marrying between a Jew and a Mm -hmm. non-Jew, couldn't be in uh, roles of government or in mass media. There was, um, they had to forfeit their businesses. They could not be educated. All kids were kicked out of school. All foreign Jews were were forced to leave the country, et cetera, et cetera. So they're still just as bad as Nazis, Nuremberg Nuremberg laws. Mm -hmm. The one difference... The one difference between Italy and Germany's race laws was that despite how terrible and unjust they all were, there wasn't any direct violence that was enacted against the Jewish population in Italy. So like in Germany, when they were rounding up. locked? Well, yeah, that. And like when they were actually deporting Jews to concentration camps and like Mm -hmm. murdering them. The final solution? Yeah, all the awful Mm -hmm. things, right? Mm-hmm. those that was not happening in Italy. Okay. So there was still oppression and, and injustice, but there was not like the physical violence against them directly from the government like that. And from what I read too, although these laws were enacted, there are many instances of people who disregarded the law a lot of times. Like for exa- for instance, there were Christians who would take over Jewish businesses for their friends, you know, in name, but then would give them the money to help you know, oh, so they had money so, to go okay. and right. Or um bankers who didn't write down the names of Jewish customers so their finances weren't confiscated. There were some That was solid. Uh, yeah. There were some refugees from Nazi occupied occupied areas who were let in at the border by guards. So there's a, a lot of refugees from other countries that were coming into Italy. Yeah. And it was mostly one of those things where people who had the were in the position to make a decision in that moment. We're kind of like, yeah, fuck, fuck your race laws, you know, whatever. I'm going to overlook this. I'm going to look the other way. <clears throat> you know, of course, that personal risk to their self, but, but also it was kind of like this, um, and well, and it wasn't the case with all Italians, but there were a lot more people that were like, no, middle finger Nazi Germany, like, and your so ideas in about Nazi race. Germany, if you were caught fraternizing, and if you don't. You know, if this does not pertain, let me know. But in Nazi Germany, if you were caught fraternizing, I will use that term, with Jews in any way, you were also punishable. Was that the same here? Uh, Not that I know of offhand. It doesn't seem like that's the case. Okay. Even if it was, they didn't enforce it? Not not really, no. It's like, it was something where... So it wasn't quite a strict an environment. Right. Okay. Right. It's estimated that there were about 50,000 Jews living in Italy at this time, 1938. Now, fast forward, July 9th, 1943, there's some shit going on in the country now. Yeah. Allied forces invade and they take the Italian island of Sicily, you know, codenamed Operation Husky, which is thanks to Operation Mincemeat, Mm -hmm. episode 38, about that wild ride. They take Sicily, Italy surrenders. So Nazi Germany swoops in and they begin their occupation of Italy in order to hold Axis ground here. Now, here's where our story really begins. So sorry, that's that's a bit of our our backdrop for it all. When the Nazis roll into Rome, things get immediately scary for the Jewish population there. Now, remember, they had been oppressed up to this point. But again, the physical violence. Right seemed like a far enough away thing but people knew people knew what was going on people knew what the nazis were doing yes but it but still they seemed like outside the borders right yeah now they're here fuck nazis are rolling in northern italy they're down in rome they've got occupied the city and even further south now again remember they've the jewish population in italy have been oppressed but they now have that physical violence from the nazis at their door quite literally yeah um Thankfully, there were some Jews who escaped because they saw the writing on the wall. But again, like I said, yeah. it's mostly the su- Jews in the southern part of Italy because they were closer to the Allied forces versus anybody in the north because you're trapped on the peninsula for the most part. In Rome, there were about 10,000 Jewish people in the city living within the ghetto. And the Nazis' first order of business upon getting into Italy was to get the SS, which everybody hates, led by a real piece of work uh named herbert kapler 
So they come in right away and they start implementing the final solution. I didn't solution recognize in Italy. that name like I thought I would. In their first pass through the city, they round up a, a little over a thousand. The number is estimated to be 1,200 Jews to send to concentration camps, of which only 15 survived. 15 people? Um, amongst the 1,200 that were sent in that first. Yeah. Along the Jewish ghetto in Rome ran the Tiber River. In the middle of the river, on an island called Tiber Island, which is appro- appropriately named, sits the beautiful Spotted Bene Fratelli. That checks out. Yeah. <laughs> right. The beautiful, the gorgeous Fate Bene Fratelli Hospital, which means do good brothers. It wasn't technically an Italian hospital because it was owned by the Vatican, mm-hmm. which is a nation unto itself. And I am going to spend some time talking about the Pope and the Holy See's role during this time because it's one of these historical moments where there are there's a lot of criticism there's a lot of talk around it i was gonna say what the fuck did the pope do during the holocaust i'm interested to know oh aren't you tell me more but back to the hospital yes so you know how earlier i said that there are quite a few italians who weren't compliant with the racial laws Mm -hmm. one such example was a young doctor named vittorio sacerdoti sacerdoti who was fired for being jewish at a public hospital and was unable to practice medicine this is when these race laws were enacted, right? Fuck off. So he gets hired at the Fate Bene Fratelli Hospital by their head physician, Giovanni Borromeo, who previously was a medical student of Sacerdoti's uncle. Okay. Handy. So yeah. Sacerdoti is, he, so he's a Jewish doctor. His uncle's like, hey, one of my students is the head physician at a hospital for the Vatican. We'll get you out of this public system here, get you over to the Vatican. There you go. We're going to get And you they can't touch there. you there because they're treated as a separate state. Got it. Right. From Tiber Island, the Fate Bene Fratelli Hospital is directly across half the river to the Jewish ghetto. And so during this period where the SS is coming through and they're gathering as many Jews as possible to put on the trucks to send to Auschwitz, they're, oh, they, they took can them back it. to Germany. Um, Poland is where Auschwitz is. Uh, back to Poland, because I knew that I was testing you. You passed. Good. Yeah, um, there you go. But so they didn't keep them in Italy. For some reason, I figured they just made a camp there and did it there. So they shipped no. them out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To already existing locations. Yeah. Okay. But they can see what's happening, and they're horrified, as many people were. They're like, yeah whoa, like this is now at our door. This is in our town. And, it's not a story uh, on the news anymore. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And all the doctors, all doctors, I should say, medical doctors, they, they take something that is what is called the Hippocratic Oath, mm-hmm. which is an ethical oath for medical doctors to first do no harm. And so with this oath at the front of their minds, they're like, well, we got to do something. We're not going to let these people die. Right. We got to get involved here. And all three of these men were all um, anti-fascists, and some of them were very outspoken about it as well, too. So they were especially on board with doing something. Right. So basically what I'm saying is these guys are like, fuck Nazis. And the- <laughs> <laughs> fuck them. As plainly as I can put it. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was having a whole diatribe about it. I'm like, really? These guys are like, fuck these guys. They're in our town. I don't like it. We got to do something. Mm-hmm. And- so the hospital became this, well, a part of the network of this underground resistance. They had a secret radio that kept in contact with the Italian resistance and indirectly. Viva la resistance! Allied forces. And a rumor started to go around amongst the Roman Jewry that the Fate Bene Fratelli Hospital, hey, they have a Jewish doctor, Dr. Mm-hmm. Sacerdoti. He'll help us. He's one of us. He's, you know, right. he can help us here at the hospital. And soon the Jewish people in town start trickling into the hospital and the doctors would admit them, air quotes, as patients. I have a feeling where this is going, but I'm excited. (laughs) Yeah. Dr. Borromeo, who was the hospital's head physician, is like, right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make up a disease. Something really aggressive, something really scary sounding. Ooh, okay, yeah, let's make it neurologically neurologically degenerative. (laughs) That's that's scary, you know, and then you die. We're going to call it Syndrome K. And, and it only K, affects Jews because they're it the only terrible affects ones. Jews, yes. Well, no, they're the ones who are 
it makes sense with the whole narrative. If they're this diseased, <clears throat> inferior mm-hmm. people, will they come down with the disease? How did they, I mean, you're feeding into their own logic. Right. Yeah. I'm behind this plan. <laughs> it's a good plan. It's so a good the plan. The K and Syndrome K standing both for Herbert Kapler and Kesslerling, Kesslerling, there we go, who was the Nazi in charge of Italian mm-hmm. occupation. So Kapler was head of the SS in Italy and then Kessler, Kesslerling, Kesslerling, goodness, he was uh, in charge of Italian occupation. So they both had K's in their name, Syndrome K, it is. But it also sounds a lot like cock disease, which also starts with a K, and is how Germans knew tuberculosis, uh, like a tuberculosis-like disease. Yeah. So very scary, and it very it kind of sounds like something else, right? Exactly. Yeah. So they could equate easily in their minds. The doctors ended up creating an entire ward for these patients, quote unquote, within the hospital. But the SS were not stupid. You know, they would come around sometimes and check on things and be like, you know, are you, how many patients do you have in here? Okay. What did they, what's, what's going on with all of them? You know, they, they had questions because they wanted to make sure they weren't hiding people in the, uh, the uh, hospital. But however, when they came around the hospital and they were told about the syndrome K, they were freaked the fuck out. Yeah. So the German troops would never want to come in there. And because uh, they're like, they, we don't want to have anything to do with it. So when German troops came in to like try to find any Jewish people, <laughs> they, they were like confronted with the syndrome K and they were like, nope, get us out of here. We won't even, we don't even want to look at it. And also, like you said, playing into their narrative, they already had these like really hateful thoughts of like, you know, they, mm-hmm. they knew where they were sending these people. And so there was this thought of like, well, just let them die here. And then we don't have to get infected, you know? So they were really yeah. trying to stay away as much as they could. So that worked for a while. But now that they're here in the hospital, they're safe for now, but like what's next, right? There's a, there's a small printing company nearby that began helping them create falsified documents with the Vatican seal on them. The doctors would change the name on the documents and then discharge their patients to go to a local convent. Okay. A sec- yeah, a secretary of the state for the Vatican was working covertly with Dr. Borromeo to get these documents. They had the Vatican seal on them. They were just changing the names. And so these people would look like they're working for the Vatican and getting to travel and go to these convents where they'd be safe. And they were, you know, technically a falsified document. It was, you know, of course, a very secretive thing because the Vatican publicly was in a position of neutrality. So let's talk about the Holy See's role during all of this. What was Tell the Pope me doing? The deeds. Yeah. Bust what, open what the... <laughs> this hot tea of goss. I need to know. <laughs> so what's goss. the Pope doing? Pope Pius XII. What's he, what's he doing with all of this? Um, well, short answer is like not a ton. And he's mm-hmm. highly criticized for that. Um, or at the very least, this is why there's, you know, two sized discussions. Right. Uh, at the very least, it's not on the surface. He's not doing much of anything. Now, whether he's allowing his secretary of state or other people within the church to do things. Um, that's another story, but we don't he's know. Not, he's not doing a pub, like a lot publicly. Publicly. No, you couldn't do a lot to be fair. This is the one semblance of leeway I will give at the time of Nazi Germany. There was so much fear and so much, uh, what is the word like unsure, so much uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I can see why people did not publicly speak out because you say the wrong thing. They firing squad your whole family. It's not uncommon. They did that shit. They had very total control. However, fear is a powerful weapon. So as you let it rule, it will, it's kind of like a snowball. It just kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So all that to be said, I hope he was doing more under the table but uh do we know is it recorded or not there are some diaries there's some books that have recently come out that are that give the records um okay from what i understand it doesn't really help explain his story too much okay from what i understand 
Uh, there was something that I I read. It was a source that I came across, and I was really mad that I couldn't find it again because okay. it was really interesting. So, Bletchley Park in England, where they where um, Alan Turing Alan Turing was working on yes, you know uh, the Enigma machine, the Enigma. right? Mm-hmm. Exactly, and all the work that they were doing there with the code breaking, there was. I really wish I could have found it, but there was talk that they could read messages that were coming out of the Vatican once they were able to start reco- uh, decoding things. And, um, and it, it sounded like it was a different case that the Pope was actually trying to do more, but that, but I, I read it once. Could not so like they sense. were sending falsified information and stuff probably, or something to throw yeah, trying to do more to off. help the allies. Yeah. Okay. But but again, I haven't been able to find that. So find I'm like, it again. Did I make that up so in my head? Publicly, because or... I don't know this information. Publicly, how did the Vatican, the Pope, Catholicism deal with the Holocaust and Nazi Germany as a whole? So when when things were first getting started with Mussolini, there was the thought that. And this is this also plays into the narrative of Mussolini not being an anti Semite, but then like just doing it to appease Hitler. So okay. that's the, the side of history. Is along with that, Italy will say, well, we as a Christian country, that doesn't fit with like hating people is not our idea. Fit, right. Doesn't fit with our religion, doesn't fit with, you know, who we're supposed to be in right. God and, you know, his people on the earth. So therefore, we're not down with race for laws reasons, or anti-Semitism. Yeah. And for those reasons, I'm out. Exactly. <laughs> um, that's, that's what is, is said. Now, of course we know that people can say one thing know, people, and do another. Yeah, People aren't always like in line with their faith and their, what their faith ideas are. We see this happen a lot in history. All the time. So, so all the fucking time. We're not to necessarily say like, oh yeah, well then that was the Italy public state, wasn't. though, which was kind of more my question. So right. did they deal... You said they were in, uh, finding messages from the Vatican to Nazi Germany. So they were in contact with them? Oh, I don't know. Just that they were... Just that they have documented messages and things okay. in their records from the Bletchley Park records Yeah, that maybe made a better case for the Pope. But I'm remembering this from a long, a little while back. Okay. And I'm not sure if I remember it very well. And also, again, I did not find the source again. So okay. I was like, well, if you I ever hope find I it, I'd be interested to up. hear. Yeah. But it's okay. We don't really need to focus that much on No, on this I was just curious, it, but... again, how the whole backdrop was looking here. So mm-hmm. I'm going to be honest. We, until you brought that up, I was like, oh, yeah, I never really thought about that as a part of the landscape at this time. And it obviously right. was. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this where the Jewish people were getting put on German trucks to be to be taken out. It was right in front of the, the Vatican, and so people were like, "Why isn't the Pope doing anything? He can say something about this." Yeah, and the documentary is a little bit well. It points out that criticism, um, mm-hmm. but for me, at the end, after watching the documentary, I was pissed. I was furious. I was like. You know, techni- historically speaking, the Pope is the most, you know, could be, is really people. one of the most power. Well, yeah, holy is one of the really holy people, but also, you know, in that political position is one of the most powerful yes. people on the planet, you know, Absolutely. and, uh, and they, he the did doctors are actually inter- interviewed in this and they make a really good point of like, you know, keeping in mind that, um, he is a political leader. So he's trying to walk that edge of neutrality with Nazi Germany. Mm-hmm. And then also he has to be this figure for like a moral compass, you know? And so it was like this weird thing that his, and historic historians debate this back and forth, you know, people are like, he should have done more. He could have done more. Yeah. And, um, and that's what the, um, the doctors were saying like, could he, should he, you know, probably, yeah, he probably should have. Yeah. But also we're kind of understanding that he has to play a couple of roles here. Yeah. Um, I think at the but, point to the fact that this is such a global tragedy. Yeah. Um, 
there are other genocides that actually, and I don't mean this at all to take away from the Holocaust. The Holocaust was fucking horrible, especially that it happened in such a modern day, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. There are other genocides throughout history, including the one when America was settled, like 18 million First Nation people were murdered. That's what? Times three of as many Jews in the Holocaust. Not taking away from that, I'm just saying scale here is monumentous. Mm -hmm. It's huge. I don't think that's a word, but I fucking made it one now. <laughs> um, a tragedy of this scope at some point. You just gotta, you know, pick a side. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it just comes down to that at a certain point. Um, again, I understand the fear that Nazi Germany had. And I think a lot of people who haven't studied it in detail do not understand that power that that fear and uncertainty had. But again, to a certain point, when you are standing there at the Vatican, watching people get loaded up, knowing what's going to happen to them, knowing where this is going, you gotta, mm -hmm. you gotta make a stand one way or the other. Yeah. And that, uh, I think that's what it comes down to, especially with a tragedy of this size. But yeah, when it came right down to it, the Pope really wasn't of much help, like much direct help at least. Mm -hmm. And so it was really great that Dr. Borromeo had a contact within the Vatican to help him out with this side of things and these documents. And then beyond that, there's a whole network of priests and convents who help the patients on the other side. And then the doctors are really grateful for that. So like, you know what, maybe yeah. the Pope didn't do anything, but his church did, like the, his people yeah. around him did. And we thank God for that. And, you know, so yeah. that's, that's their piece on it, uh, which yeah. I think is worth saying. Yeah. But now here's where things get dicey. <laughs> so like I said more, earlier, the more SS, dicey. <laughs> more dicey. Yeah. The SS were not stupid, as I mentioned. So mm -hmm. German soldiers would come in and they, they could. They could kind of shoo those guys away a little bit easier, be like, oh, these are really sick patients. And they're like, okay, we don't want to have anything to do with it. But <laughs> but the SS is on to them. And technically, the hospital belonged to the Vatican and therefore is neutral and off limits. But they're Nazis. They're Nazis. They, they, don't, play they don't play by the rules they because by the rules. They, they make them. Yeah. They make like, them. We're going to do what we want. That's just how it is. So, And they started to suspect that something's up at the hospital. And they're like, all right, we're going to go to the hospital and check things out. So they take two trucks and they're, they load up the trucks with a bunch of SS officers and they're headed to the hospital. There's a little boy that sees what's happening and he runs to the hospital and he's like, the SS are on their way. They're coming. Tiny hero. And yeah. A little tiny hero, right? Like that's the thing. This is the network of all the word, word of mouth, you know, like that's how this mm -hmm. underground is, is working. This resistance is working. And uh, so the SS on their way to their hospital, Two trucks were supposed to arrive. One does and then realizes, hey, where's the second truck? Oh, man, now I got to go back and get his ass. So the, the first truck goes back. It gives the people inside the hospital an extra half hour to hide the radio, Shit. hide weaponry and information from the resistance. Um, all the patients like to let them all know, hey, here's what's going on. Don't worry. I've got you. I'm going to take care of you. But act sick. <laughs> I need yeah. you guys coughing. Start chewing food <laughs> like, and pretending to talk. throw it up when they get here. <laughs> so the SS comes to the hospital and they're like pulling up papers and they're like, give, uh, give me those reports. We want to see if there's any fake patients. And so Dr. Borromeo, like very calmly, he takes one a tour of the hospital. He's like, here's our patients here for this. Here's yeah. our patients here for that. I'm going to keep everything calm so no one freaks the fuck out. And then they get to the Syndrome K ward. Ward, yeah. Yeah, and he's like, oh, now, gentlemen, behind these doors are some very sick patients. They're sick with something called Syndrome K. We're studying it. We really don't know much about it. It's very, very serious, uh, very contagious. They're very, very sick. Here's the, here are the symptoms, you know, nausea, vomiting, da, 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 attacks your nervous system. Then you die, you know. <laughs> very dramatic. Like, uh, very dramatic. Like, but if you if you want to come in, you can come see them. Right. It's just like <laughs> it's really awful. It's really, really awful. But hey, if you want if to you tempt must. fate, if you must, you can come in here. And they were like, Yeah, actually, we do want to come in here. And they get in. <laughs> and everyone's like, <laughs> oh, we're so sick. We're so sick. 
And uh, so the, the SS, they go in, they took a look around, and then all of a sudden they're like, actually, this is kind of gross. Let's get out of here. Um, <laughs> but they And they got totally freaked out. They're like, oh, no, that is bad. That's gross. But again, they're like, okay, well, keep them in here. Don't let them out. And Thank the you, long- SS soldiers. How right? fucking scientific of you. Dumbasses. <laughs> um, not dumb. They weren't. They weren't dumb. It's just shitheads. Bloodheads. Anyway. <laughs> But the longer the Germans occupied Italy and occupied Rome, really, the scarier things got because now yeah. Allied forces are starting to bomb. It's hand to mouth survival for the citizens, really. Everyone's so hungry, they're starving. Um, yeah. Allied forces are trying to advance north through Italy, but it's slow. The terrain's hard to get through and therefore easier it's to defend very for Germany. In, uh, Italy, right? Yeah, well, this section, yeah, there's okay. it's, uh, got some hills and some mountains. And so Northern Italy and Rome is isolated and just holding on to the hope to be liberated soon. Yeah. But the SS is on to Dr. Borromeo mm-hmm. though, and they call his house and his wife is like, Oh, not the doctor. No, he's not here right now. Yeah. He's gone. He's left. He's gone to work. And he goes and he picks up the phone. He's like, no, I'm still here. Who is this? <laughs> Shit. Like this is the SS prison and we're sending a card for you. Says what? Prison. Yeah. As in- we're taking you jail. away. Yeah, we're going to take you away. And he's taken away. He's imprisoned. Thinking he's never going to see his family again. Really. Yeah. Um, this is that so fear head, I was talking about? Yeah. So that head physician's been imprisoned. The Allied troops are now breaking through, but still the progress north is slow. The city is in trouble. But they make it. Rome is liberated and the Nazis were defeated in Italy. The fifth fifth army, they finally break through, get into Rome, hurrah. <laughs> okay. Everyone's liberated. It's great. Rome was returned to its citizens after 21 years. Wow. During that time period when when the city was falling, Mussolini and his mistress were found and killed. So as you said, they're like Oh the people, yeah, the people got them. troops. If I remember correctly, they found them and justice was done upon them. And yes, Rome was returned to his its citizens after 21 years. 80% of Italy's Jewish population survived the Holocaust because people like these doctors and the larger Italian population was like, nah, nah, not here, Nazis. Uh-uh. You can't tell us what to do. <laughs> you can't tell us what to do. Get out of here. We're protecting our own. Mm-hmm. The three doctors at Fate Benefratelli Hospital, Giovanni Borromeo, Vittorio Sacerdoti, and Adriano Asacini did their jobs as doctors. They helped people, they saved lives, and they allowed for future generations of those that they saved. Mm-hmm. In later interviews, including the documentary Syndrome K, it's estimated that there were about 100 people, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little less. The actual number's still unknown. Mm-hmm. But they've estimated that it might be around the 100 mark of people who were saved by being diagnosed with syndrome K. Wow. And in the words of Dr. Vittorio Sacerdoti, bravery always wins. So did Ugh. he get in prison once Rome came back to its citizens? Yeah. So, so okay. he was good. Yeah. He was fine. In fact, actually in the, um, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say he was fine, but he was released, I should say. Um, but, um, no, I mean, I don't know. I don't oh, think okay. he was, I was like, like, Oh, that's hard, not good. But I mean, like, I know you're probably not okay. Being, in an being SS held prison. by Nazis? No, yeah. probably not. That is <laughs> a fair didn't assumption. Say, like he was like horribly harmed or anything necessarily, but um, yeah. In fact, actually, in the documentary Syndrome K, mm-hmm. uh, Doctor Sacerdoti and uh, Doctor Osicini were both interviewed. They're much older. I mean, this this documentary is from 2019. Wow. And so of course they're they're much They're're older. Still alive? But, uh, cool. Yeah. But then uh, Doctor Barromeo's son was the one who was interviewed. Dr. Borromeo okay. passed away, I think like in the seventies or the eighties. So was the son alive or born yeah. after this? He was uh he was alive during it. He he says he wow. remembers his father getting taken away by the SS. Wow. What mm-hmm. I mean whew. Yeah. Did he talk about how that like how scary it was or yeah, he says that's something that a little boy will always remember is seeing his father dragged away like that. I was that does not surprise yeah. me. I think that is something that a child would not forget. Yeah. 
Damn. So it it was great. Yeah, there, it was great to have like those firsthand interviews from from those men. Uh, where can and, we find uh, that documentary? Survivors. So I think you can rent it for a few bucks on um, like Tubi or who something like that. Like okay. if you just type in Syndrome K in, in Google, K, yeah. it'll show you a few things. I think like Amazon you can. But I I just had free access to it through my Hoopla app, which is like a, okay. a library app. I was like. Well, well, hell yeah, this is great. Nice. <laughs> Thanks, Hoopla. So I was able to watch it through that. But uh, yeah, it'll be down in my show notes as well, too, so you can look look at that. But that's the story of Syndrome K, which is one of those pretty cool stories of just one of the many things that people were doing across Europe mm-hmm. to to be a resistance to Nazi Germany and just give them the big middle finger and say, like, you know what? No, this is not on our watch. Yeah. <laughs> like, Mm-mm. which it comes at a, like a great personal risk and cost to those people. I think it, just the bravery that people show in those moments, I think it's really easy to have that sort of hindsight 2020 be like, well, I would have done this or I would have done that. It, and stuff. Again, and that's why I know, brought right? up that whole, <laughs> yeah. that, that, that fear that Nazi mm-hmm. Germany had. I mean, even Americans were afraid of them. We're an ocean right. away. You know, like mm-hmm. that's it. That's why I brought that up because it. I don't think people understand how all-consuming it was and how much mental and emotional sway they held, right? Because yeah. of the crimes and all that. Um, it's easy to say what you could have done when you weren't there, right? It's a lot harder yeah. to be in the situation and have the bravery and, and courage to do it in that moment. Yeah, and that's what we talked about in the the third wave social experiment yes in that one well that's why i understood that because they made us mm-hmm. do that in german class so yeah <laughs> they make exactly, us read yeah. that which i it's very important i think it was a uh, priceless bit of education i got there so mm-hmm. yeah so mm-hmm. i'll leave that episode in the show notes as well too because i think that's a really good yeah. good connector because a lot of people will say well like how how did the German people go along with this? Like how were they okay with this? And that most of them were lesson, not. <laughs> no, yes. and that was the lesson was that yeah mm-hmm. it is just like that um, the manner in which it was done yeah you know, and the momentum really mm-hmm. yeah so um, yeah so that was uh that was a really great bit of history to to learn from and uh just to research and i got to learn about the jaguar warriors that was freaking and the cool. eagle warriors and the eagle warriors yes don't want to leave anybody out yeah that was amazing that was so much fun to learn about so cool what a, uh, an amazing group of people right very fierce mm-hmm. would not want to have come across them in uh battle <laughs> no no yeah absolutely not like I think at that point I probably want just the world to just open up and swallow me because I I don't know if I'd want to fight against and I don't want to be taken and I don't like yeah (laughs) just like just I just melt into the ground I don't know right oh just go offer to like voluntarily be a part of uh the whole Aztec empire and just (laughs) hope that they'll take you on as a farmer work your way up the social system can I just join you guys is that okay I'm not gonna not gonna cause any trouble promise perfect we were missing one last sacrifice not what i meant (laughs) not what i was asking for thank you thank you so much Uh, goodness wow well so we've we've lived laughed and loved tonight (laughs) i didn't want to use that phrase it just fell out and i feel really bad about it i'm so sorry well like i said that whole joke where everybody writes in the curse of the live, laugh, love, I'm going to write in, <laughs> on my walls in my house. What did I say? Decimate, decapitate, and destroy. <laughs> Heartwarming. <laughs> like that the really beautiful, script. right? The absolutely amazing calligraphy. People are going to be like, mm-hmm. oh, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to my abode. <laughs> Fucking yikes. <laughs> She's, she's different <laughs> oh goodness Ooh, that's fun 
And we're going to do it again in a couple of weeks. Uh, we've got episode 67 coming up in a couple of weeks. So that'll be, that'd be good times. Uh, Katie, anything, anything else for the good people? Good? I don't think so. I mean, you know, don't be an asshole. <laughs> Try to keep okay. the dictatorship low in the world. Okay. Okay. <laughs> It was a uh, great, great, it was a rough awesome episode, check. dude. <laughs> Is it rough? I don't know. It, it was. I mean, it, I mean, it, it deals it with heavy well. topics, but I think yeah. we we focus on. Um, that's why it's like I'm not going to go. The I mean, best it, parts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's it, you know when you focus on what you know that people were, that people can do the right thing. Yes. I mean, you see the worst in hu- in people and in, in humanity, but then you Oftentimes, have the stories of. In the face of all that, yes. people do the most ex- extraordinary, wonderful things and the right thing. Yes. That's Especially good because a lot of times these are stories that you don't get to hear hmm. and they're not spotlighted enough. And without sounding way too fucking corny, um, it is those it. small moments of courage that to the families of the hundred or so that were probably saved kind of made all the difference in the world Mm -hmm. because without them, you know, kids would not have parents. I mean, um, like look at Anne Frank of her whole family, only the dad survived. Mm -hmm. So stuff like that, you know, families are torn apart. It's, it's small little simple acts like that where people put their lives on the line, risked everything They'll never probably have a movie made about them or anything, but their risk and sacrifice they made did make all the difference in the world to somebody because you mm-hmm. save lives. Absolutely. So yeah. That's I'm. That's why I enjoy these little stories like that. Good. Because they are. Yeah. There are those little They're moments of light in a big dark topic such as mm-hmm. World War II, Holocaust, and all that. So yeah, it's good. Bring, bring a little, bring your light to the world, Laurel. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Yeah. Cause I, they are definitely uh, important to tell and important to know and understand that, uh, you know, as Dr. As Sam said, bravery always says, wins. Yep. And Sam Wise Gamgee said, those were the stories. What did he say that worth listening to? Because there's some good worth fighting for or something. I was like, fucking preach, Sam. Sam. And then he looks at Frodo and goes, I can't carry it for you, but I can (laughs) carry you. And you're like, "Ah," you're punching the screen. Like, get it. (laughs) Friendship. (laughs) So we'll do it again in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, folks, get money, get high, give love. And Katie. Viva la resistance. Bye.